Oh my god. And just to be on the safe side, spoilers? Not that I think I really needed, but just in case anyone hasn't seen the finale yet, but spoilers? <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is like, wow. That, that got... We, we knew it was going to end dark, but... Man. <laughs> Everyone's dying. On both sides. <laughs> it's not quite that bad. It's not Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah, where it seems like he tossed a dart at a dartboard at but pictures of his characters going, Who am I going to kill this time? Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> now look through my ways of death and randomly toss them onto the floor and randomly pick up one. Ooh, death at a wedding. I like that one. <laughs> Oh, uh, please no. The Red Wedding was very difficult to read. <laughs> now on to what we're actually talking about. Hello, I'm Lux. And I'm Ember. And this is our thoughts on Ruby, Season 3, Episodes 11 and 12. Oh, my poor heart. <laughs> Painful. But they've been warning us since the first episode of Season 3. And in case that wasn't warning enough, they also had the... Parental disclaimer, because apparently some people let young children watch this. <laughs> Going back to the whole, if it's animated, it must be for children. Yeah. Which, considering the trailer videos, you know, where Ruby cuts up a bunch of werewolves and Yang smashes some guy in his jewels? Come on, really? <laughs> so, a lot happened in these two episodes... And things ended poorly for our heroes, which we knew was going to happen. Briefly skipping ahead to 12, because Lux brought this up in the title sequence, Pura is the first one to get separated from the group uh, near the end of the title sequence where they're all falling. So, rather predictive. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of stuff that points out what's actually going to happen in this season. Not just in this season or in anything that was involved in this season, they actually did it in season one. <laughs> yes, going all the way back to the comment about Ruby having silver eyes. And Osben's comment about how he's made more mistakes than anyone ever. Mm -hmm. And not just that, the songs that were released on season one's album tell you a lot about what's going to happen in season three. Or what happened in season three. Let's just say I listen to them a lot when I'm doing artwork. <laughs> So I've been taking apart the songs as I've been working on the artwork for this podcast and going, what, wait, this stuff's starting to match up with this. Uh-oh, what the hell this song's, uh-oh. <laughs> this is even worse than I thought. Going back to episode 11, near the beginning, there's that nice fight between Torchwick, Neapolitan, and Ruby. Yes. Very disappointed that Torchwick got eaten by a Grimm. He's the kind of villain you enjoy because he's not evil for the sake of evil he's got kind of that cockiness to him i mean i still want to see ruby kick his tail but you also see he has other reasons for being on the quote-unquote evil side or winning side because apparently he has other stakes in this fight than just profit keeping himself alive Especially since we got hints of his actual backstory in the little speech he gives to Ruby as he's kicking her and hitting her with his cane. Yeah, nice guy, Torchwick. Picking on a young teenage girl. <laughs> well, we never said he was a nice guy. <laughs> we're just saying that he's not evil like Cinder, though we're starting to get hints of backstory with her. And not just in that flashback where she was gathering the troops, as it were. Mm -hmm. But with her interactions with Pyrrha in the next episode. Mm-hmm. But staying in 11, I like that Neapolitan was literally carried away. <laughs> that was a nice escape because I doubt at this point that episode 11 Ruby could have won against her. Because she's a crafty creature. And I'm not saying that she's a faunus. I'm saying she's a creature. As mm -hmm. in living thing. The one thing I'm wondering about is, is she actually mute or is she more of a person who doesn't talk unless she absolutely needs to? Well, there's a lot of advantages to being silent. It can very much unnerve your opponents. And considering all the technology that exists, I'm sure that if she was actually mute, they could come up with some sort of tech that would allow her to speak anyways, without having to type it into a keyboard first. And episode 11, we finally get to learn what's in the box. 
<laughs> Velvet's box of weapons is literally a box of weapons. Mm -hmm. Now, there's something interesting that you brought up. Is the box of weapons connected to her, her photography? I would tend to think that it could be, because... Why else take that picture of Weiss at the end after she's done her summoning? Well, partial summoning. Yay, Weiss! <laughs> also, my brain just pointed out that I think it has the similar designs to her box, too, so they definitely could be connected. Mm -hmm. And you're right, nice touch on Weiss, especially the touch after it, she's shown really exhausted from summoning the creature. Also, more hints that I may be right with my theory on Ren how he's actually physically weak. Or has some sort of medical condition or something that impairs his physical body. And staying on Weiss for just a moment, very exhausted after that summoning, and it was just the arm of the creature. Now contrast that with when Winter had her summoned Grimm that she was petting. Winter was very uh, chill with that. So either what Weiss summoned was a heck of a lot more powerful than Winter's Grimm, or summoning for the first time is extremely exhausting, or both. Or just summoning period is extremely exhausting, but Winter's had more practice at it, so she knows how much energy to put into it to have a better ratio of energy versus exertion. Because you can sometimes you can use a lot more energy than you really need to to do something. So if she gets better, she could get a whole lot more efficient at it. And moving on to the real first sad thing, <laughs> Yang versus Adam. Ooh. Not to mention that, before I move on to that, now that I think about it, let's talk about Adam for a moment. Before, we thought he may have been misunderstood, but this time I'm thinking he has... He went from being someone who was kind of tricked into doing this and betraying her a little bit to, dude, you sound a lot like a psychopath. You don't even sound like some guy who's trying to liberate people. You sound like someone who's just twisted. Also, a little technical thing, at least on, uh, from my perception. The voice actor for Adam definitely feels a little out of place because he hasn't had as much time with his character compared to Blake, the voice actress for Blake, who's been with the character for three seasons now. You can definitely tell there's a difference between someone who's used to the character and someone who's only recently gotten the more lines with this character. Especially when he says words like love and stuff like that. It felt, his performance felt more like he was reading the lines compared to, especially Blake's, which were very emotional lines. Yeah, so the question is, was this accidental or was it deliberate? Because a very flat delivery could fit in with the deranged persona. So, was it the actor, or was it the vocal director? Mm, or even the editor. Mm -hmm. And now we move on to Yang's poor dismemberment. <laughs> At least the disintegration, I'm assuming, cauterized the cut because we didn't really see any blood. So, we don't have an arm to try to reattach, but at least she wasn't going to bleed to death. Mm. I don't actually remember seeing the part that was cut off disintegrate. I remember seeing it fall to the ground and the wound looking different than I would expect a wound to look because it was kind of glowing. Yeah, it looked more disintegrative to me, but that may have just been the way they were portraying it with the silhouette style. Briefly, one last thing on Eleven, the lovely little tete-a-tete uh, -tete with Crow and Ironwood. Oh, and speaking of Ironwood, dude, he's cybernetic. Yeah, it's like, how much? 80, 90 percent? <laughs> it almost looked like his head was almost completely removed from his body. What's going on there, man? What the hell happened to you? <laughs> mm -hmm. And of course, to the audience, it was very obvious that Crow was not attacking Ironwood, but attacking something behind Ironwood, because Ironwood made the mistake of saying the area was secure. Which is just asking the universe to send in more attacks. Mm -hmm. And I love Sun's, speaking of which, Sun's reaction to, Not another robot! Like, come on! <laughs> Very much so. I did like Ironwood's defensive posture, though. He even changed the grip on the gun to make it clear that he could not possibly attack Crow. I mean, he could have still punched, but 
Fist versus Scythe and Lesser Yang, not a good idea. Also, we finally get to see the full blown look of the Psy that Crow has. Mm -hmm. Okay, did you want to touch on your theory here? Because you thought of it at episode 11 and episode 12's ending supports it. Yeah, it's probably a good idea. Um, after I watched this episode, it kind of clicked into my head like, wait a minute, could it actually be one of the classic maidens or original maidens, I should say, that is actually behind this? And I brought this theory up to you and you immediately said... I said that it was winter and you were wondering how I came to that conclusion and in under three seconds. Because <laughs> mm -hmm, I was like, damn! <laughs> Well, we know fall is the oldest, and fall is accounted for, so we know it's not fall. Winter is the youngest, which means that she may have at some point felt overshadowed by her sisters. Also, she's the baby of the family, and she could, she or any of the original maidens, if that does happen to be engineered by any of the maidens, could have issue with how they were forced to retreat and become legend, or eventually felt the burden of the powers that they were given, or didn't like the way the powers were handled as they were transferred from generation to generation. This could have been seen as a defiling of their sisters and their powers and purpose. Hmm. And Winter, being the quiet, contemplative one, I think would have the patience to carry out such a long-term plan. And then skipping all the way to the end of episode 12 because it ties back into this theory when we finally see the female narrator that we've been hearing along with Osbin talking along with Osbin we see that she is white which is a winter color and also that her hairstyle is similar if you compare it across the four and use only the four maidens as reference is most similar to winter's hairstyle Mm -hmm. Though I think she may have been corrupted by something with the way she looks. Yes, she definitely could have been corrupted. Let's not forget how Cinder had that weird spider grim-like thing inside of her. So if this person was feeling, you know, this upset and this anger or this frustration, wouldn't they be more susceptible to something like that? I mean, that's kind of standard. In Star Wars, you fall to the dark side. In My Little Pony, you become Nightmare Moon. Well, I just had another theory pop into my head. Um, maybe the power itself corrupted her, and maybe that's the reason the other sisters eventually gave their powers up to other people. But the power transfers at death. It, it can transfer at death, I think, but they also mentioned that it transferred at a different time as well. Because they said they couldn't do it other ways with the lady who was in the container because she was unconscious and near death. Well, yeah, it was because she was still alive, and what Iron One's equipment was going to do wasn't necessarily going to be a direct transfer of the power. So I'm thinking there's other ways that the maidens themselves can transfer the power, and maybe it was their sister, um, Winter, going a bit evil that made the rest of them start seeking out other peoples to have their powers so they wouldn't be fully burdened with the power for too long? Possible. And maybe this is one of the mistakes that... Osbin references. Also, his mistake could be in giving the Maidens all his power in the first place. Mm -hmm. And yes, we're still theorizing that Ozpin is the old man. <laughs> it is theory until proven otherwise. Because that's how theories work. And there's more evidence towards... Moving on to the actual episode 12, since it's right at the beginning of the episode, there's even more evidence to prove that his semblance is time, and therefore he probably has the ability to live longer when he fights Cinder, because he's obviously not just moving fast, but I'm thinking he's able to react because he can slow down time around him, or at least our perception, you know, everyone else's. He can speed up his time, so everything seems slower to him, is what I was trying to say. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which improves his reaction time and allows him to somewhat hold his own against Cinder, who now has the full power of the Fall Maiden. And I don't think... Ozpin died in that fight. No, but I would still like to know how Crow ended up with his staff. And basically the moment she turned around, this is now moving on to Pira, the moment she turned around and started to like, I should go back and help. I'm like, no, don't go back and help. You're not going to help. Oh. Yes. I'm amazed at how multifunctional those lockers are, though. 
They hold your weapons, you can use them to attack monsters, you can use them as rockets, you can use them as escape pods. Mm -hmm. Very handy. Makes sense that they, would only ha they wouldn't only have one function, if you think about it. You know, just, just, just to hold your weapons and have them remotely located to you? Hmm. I'm pretty sure they were designed with their multi-use in mind. <laughs> I mean, not exactly for those things, but they were probably going, yeah, there's probably more utility to this than just holding my weapons. Mm-hmm. And there's poor Ruby finding out about her sister's arm. And poor Blake. Yes. And so Blake has run off and feeling incredibly guilty and unable to face Yang. So now Yang feels betrayed. I wasn't going that far ahead. <laughs> Sorry. It's playing in the background. That's where I was. <laughs> I'm mostly talking about the scene where Ruby first sees that her sister's arm is cut off and Blake and her are laying on the ground. <laughs> yes, holding hands, looking horribly pathetic while Ren and Nora are crouching there all week. And Sun is going, you guys are, what? You're going back in? <laughs> are you crazy? Did you see the size of that thing? <laughs> Even the bad guys are running away. <laughs> Yes, but this is Ruby, who does not ever give up. Mm -hmm. I've got a plan. You always do. <laughs> mm -hmm. And run up the side of the tower, but not quite quick enough. Mm -hmm. And then just before that, we get an interesting conversation between Pyrrha and Cinder. I think this gives even more hints to a very interesting, probably tragic backstory for Cinder. Yes, that whole thing of, do you believe in destiny? Yes. Shoot. Mm -hmm. And that very interesting way in which Cinder finished off Pyrrha, more of a golden disillusion than just an injury. Mm -hmm. Though it seemed more like a disintegration to me. <laughs> yeah, and then Ruby kind of... I, I want to see Super Saiyan, but it's different. And it's just... It's really neat, and apparently she froze the giant Grimm still attached to the tower, and now I'm wondering what the heck happened to Cinder. Did she somehow get away? Is she partially frozen? Is she actually up on the tower, frozen underneath the Grimm? Probably not, but very interesting, and the power seeming to come out of her eyes supports the theory that Ruby is already a maiden. However, her discussion with her Uncle Crow later about the legend of those with silver eyes makes it sound more like, okay, there are only four maidens, but there are more people with silver eyes, even though they're very rare. So combining what we know of the tale of the four maidens with what Crow shared about those with silver eyes and the fact that Summer Rose also had silver eyes I am sticking with the theory that Ruby Rose is not yet a maiden. Mm. Which sounds a lot like a Medusa thing. And another thing he also brought up is uh, another monster, which is kind of funny. The, the line about that they could kill Grimm just by looking at them also reminds me of a creature called a basilisk. Mm -hmm. And now we get to the part you were talking about how Yang's all... Mm. I can understand she was depressed because that's kind of a very traumatic thing to happen to you. But I can't wait till she gets over her depression and starts, like, training or something and finding out, like, wait a minute, I can get a really awesome arm? <laughs> yeah, well, it's very difficult for Yang, who is a brawler, to... So she's not only lost her arm, she's lost her weapon, she's lost her fighting style, and she's lost her friend because Blake ran away. Ah, and then we get the formation of a new team. What would you call this? Let's see. R... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Well, would you put R in front? Because Jean's technically the leader of Team Juniper, and Ruby was the leader of Team Ruby, which, of course, is now fragmented. So since Team Ruby only has one active member at the moment because Weiss has been kidnapped by her father, Yang is injured, and Blake is absent without leave, and Team Juniper is missing one member. So, time to team up and go find out what they can learn. And oh my god, Crow can actually turn into a crow. Yeah, and I think the next season we're going to find out even more backstory about Cinder. Like where she came from and stuff like that. So, final thoughts? Uh, this was an excellent season, a very difficult ending, and it's difficult because they made us care about the characters. <laughs> 
And, you know, we know now that they're not afraid to kill main characters off. A lot of times main characters are sacred. Mm -hmm. It's called plot armor. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's also called having your name in the title. Bob and George reference, check. <laughs> but Pure is not on Team Ruby, so she didn't have that protection. Mm -hmm. Also, a lot of Team Juniper's members have interesting associations with other mythical heroes, specifically Jean and Pyrrha. Pyrrha was associated with Achilles, and Jean is with the Jean of, uh, Jean of, eh, Jean of Arc. I can't say it right now. <laughs> no, you cannot. God, Lex, what is it with you and being unable to speak? Jean of Arc, which does not end well for St. Joan, but gives Jean an excellent chance of seeing Pyrrha if she happens to be some sort of spirit. Mm -hmm. What's really interesting is if you notice, they actually do shoot Pyrrha in the ankle, which is where the Achilles tendon is. Mm -hmm. And that was a big thing with Achilles. <laughs> well, yeah, because he was dipped in this pool by his mother that like made his skin impenetrable, but she was holding him by the ankle. So that was the one part that wasn't covered. Mm -hmm. Though Nora and Ren both have better um, characters to be associated with because both characters live. They just had many problems. <laughs> so it's going to be interesting. Overall, I like this season. Had a very dark theme to all of it. And as you said, it shows that they're willing to take that leap and make the story really heavy by killing a main character. Yes, but it didn't feel like they did it just to prove that they could. Mm-hmm. And they're not doing it at the drop of a hat. Cough, cough. <laughs> You were supposed to say Game of Thrones in between your coughs there. I was leaving it out for reasons. <laughs> oh, you think um, Game of Thrones fans watch our channel? <laughs> Maybe in the future when we get more subscribers. <laughs> well, I hope you've enjoyed our thoughts on Ruby Season 3, Episodes 11 and 12 season finale. Thanks for listening. If you like Lux's art, you can find more of it on DeviantArt and Tumblr. Really enjoy listening to us blather on? Try subscribing. Also, comment sections there. Please be nice. Really, really like Lux's art? He does take commissions and also has a Patreon. All links in the description.